Hi and welcome to our fifth podcast on medical statistics and our third podcast on hypothesis testing. In our first podcast on hypothesis testing we uh, were introduced to what's called the process, how we go about doing hypothesis testing um, and we looked at an example where there was a single observation um, and the population under the null hypothesis had a known mean and a known standard deviation. Last time in Hypothesis Testing 2, uh, we had an introduction to sampling, um, a brief canter through the central limit theorem, um, and then we looked at a specific example where this time we had multiple observations, and under the null hypothesis, uh, the known population had a known mean and a known standard deviation. So this time we're going on to Hypothesis Testing 3, um, and we're looking this time at, again, we've got multiple observations, but this time uh, the population under the null hypothesis, we know what the mean is, uh, but we don't know what the standard deviation is. And this is going to lead us to consider what's called the student's t test and the student's t distribution. Um, and then we're also going to think a little bit about what a one and a two sided or tailed test is. Okay, so previously when we've been looking at um, hypothesis testing, we have used the contrived example of serum sodium levels. Uh, this was great because, you know, we're doctors, we know a lot about serum sodium, we know what the mean is, we know what the standard deviation is, and so that meant that we knew what we were working with. However, often when we're doing research, uh, we're in a situation where we don't know what the standard deviation of the population is, and it's this case that we're going to look at today. It was a problem that was first encountered uh, by a man who was working for a beer company. The man was called William Gossett, and the beer company, as you might be able to tell from the picture, was Guinness. So Gossett uh, wanted to be able to do some statistical tests um, on the Guinness making process, and he wanted to use small sample sizes. And he ended up coming up with what was called the T-distribution and the T-test, uh, but because he was working in a competitive environment, he didn't want to tip off um, Guinness's competitors when he published his work. And so he published it under the pseudonym of Student. And that's why the t-test is known as Student's t-test. It was actually uh, discovered by a man called Gossett. So perhaps we should be calling it Gossett's t-test. So unfortunately our example today doesn't involve beer. Suppose that you're working on a vascular firm um, and your consultant has heard that the average estimated blood loss for an open emergency abdominal aortic aneurysm repair is 2,750 milliliters. Now she's interested to know how her results compare. And she's collected um, estimated blood loss for the last nine emergency AAA repairs that she's done. And has found that uh, she has a mean of uh, 3 liters, so 3,000 milliliters, and a standard mean of 100. She said that you've recently been applying yourself to uh, the study of medical statistics and so, so she has asked you to do the numbers. The question is how are we going to go about doing this? Well we go about it the same way we usually would. We'd form a good clinical question then we would come up with a research hypothesis which in this case would look something like is my consultant's estimated blood loss greater than the average estimated blood loss for emergency open abdominal aortic aneurysm repair? We'd have a null hypothesis, which would say that there is no difference between the two. Um, and then we would work out some kind of descriptive statistic. In this case, we're going to use the mean. So um, our mean is 3,000 milliliters of 3 liters. And then we come to the crux of the matter, which is you need to work out what the chances of getting this statistic is under the null hypothesis. Now, if we knew what the standard deviation of the, the whole population was, then we'd be in the same situation as last week, uh, where we could, under the null hypothesis, work out where our consultants mean of 3,000 milliliters lie, um, and then ask the question, how likely is it that we'd get this, by chance, under the null hypothesis? Um, and we'd work out how many standard deviations away from the mean it is, and then we'd have come up with our p-value. We'd just look it up in some statistical tables, or ask our stats program of choice to tell us. So let's suppose that we did know the population standard deviation and say it was 300. Then we know what to do. 
Uh, we know that our sample comes from the sampling distribution of the mean for samples of size 9. Um, we know uh, that because the whole population has mean 2750, then our sampling distribution has mean 2750. And because the standard deviation of the whole population is 300, then we know that our standard error is 300 divided by the square root of 9, which is 100. So then the test that we have to do is, or what we have to ask is, how likely is it that we would observe our value of 3000 milliliters or greater um, from this normal distribution with mean of 2750 and standard error of 100, just by chance. Uh, and then we could look up and we find that um, our value is uh, 2.5 standard deviations above the mean, um, and the probability of getting a value which is 2.5 standard deviations above the mean or more is 0.062. So let's look at that with some formulae. Tradition dictates that when you're asking how many standard deviations above the mean in a normal distribution, some value lies, then you give it the, the letter Z. So that's why we've got Z here. So what we've, what we've got here is um, our consultant's mean, and we subtract from that the, the population mean, and then we divide that by the standard error um, of our sampling distribution, and that works out to be 2.5. Great, we can then go on and do our um, hypothesis test from that. But what happens if we don't know what the population standard deviation is. Well here's our first formula again and we can plug in what we know. So we know our consultant's average estimated blood loss, we know the population um, average estimated blood loss 2750 and um, we know that our sample size is 9 so we'd be dividing by root 9 uh, but what we're missing, what we don't know is the standard deviation of the population. So we're stuck, we can't work out a Z value, and we can't go on to do our statistical test. So that leaves us with two options. Option number one is to give up and say, well, there's no way that we can do statistical testing in this situation. And then option number two is to try and figure out some kind of workaround. Um, and that's what the t-test does. So we can't use the Z statistic because we don't know sigma, the population standard deviation. But what we could do is estimate sigma. Um, and one way that we could go about doing that is to use the sample st standard deviation. So we'd look at our consultant's nine results, work out the sample standard deviation for those nine results, and then use this instead of the population standard deviation to work out our statistic. And that's what we call the T statistic. So it's a a modification of the Z statistic where we use the sample standard deviation because we don't know the population standard deviation. So where we couldn't work out our Z statistic, we can work out our T statistic because we know what S is. We can just work it out. We get the figures from our consultant and put it in the calculator. And if we do that, then it turns out that T is equal to round about 1.91. So now, to test our hypothesis, we need to answer the question, under the null hypothesis, how likely is it that we get a t-statistic of 1.91 or greater? So the last piece of the puzzle is to realise that t doesn't come from a normal distribution, like the z-statistic did. If we were to repeatedly take samples of size 9 from the general population, work out t, and then take another and work out t, take another sample of size 9, work out t, keep on going, uh, then they will end up forming a distribution which looks quite a lot like the normal distribution, but not quite. They would form what's called a t distribution. Now, there are loads of different t distributions, depending on what size of a sample we have. So in front of us here is uh, a grey line, and that grey line represents um, a normal distribution. So a normal distribution, mean zero, standard deviation of one. Let's plot on a t distribution. Okay, so this is the t distribution for sample size of nine. And as you can see, um, it's a bit flatter. More of the um, area under the t distribution lies out towards 
the left and lies out towards the right. And you might expect that because we're um, making a, an estimate of the standard deviation. We're not quite as sure as we would be if we knew what the standard deviation of the population was. And so the t-distribution is a bit more spread out. Now, when we've got a sample size of 9, uh, we use uh, what's called the t-distribution with 8 degrees of freedom. Here's another line. So this is the t-distribution for sample size of 20. So it's still a bit more spread out than the normal distribution, but it looks a bit more like it. And for sample sizes of 20, this is called the t-distribution with 19 degrees of freedom. Here's another t-distribution, looking even more like the normal distribution now. So this is the t-distribution for sample sizes of 30. We say it has 29 degrees of freedom. In general, if we have a sample size of n, then we end up with a t-distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. And you might remember that the formula for the sample standard deviation has n minus 1 in its denominator, and that's where this uh, nomenclature comes from. So, we've had to invent a new statistic. We're not using the Z statistic anymore, we're using the T, t, t statistic. And we're no longer comparing it with a normal distribution, we're comparing it with a T distribution. But, we have a method for carrying out our hypothesis test, uh, when we do not know what the standard deviation of our population is. So let's finish off now by thinking about the difference between one and two sided tests, also known as one and two tailed tests. There are different research hypotheses that we could have came up with. One is that our consultant's estimated blood loss is greater than that in the general population. And by general population we mean uh, the general population of uh, estimated blood losses for emergency open AAA repairs. The second research hypothesis uh, could be that our consultant's estimated blood loss is less than that in the general population. And the third is that our consultant's estimated blood loss is different than that in the general population. Different could be less than, uh, or it could be greater than. Now, it's worth noting that each of these research hypotheses would have the same null hypothesis associated with them, that being that there is no difference between our consultant's estimated blood loss and that in the general population. So let's think about that first research hypothesis that our consultant's estimated blood loss is greater than that in the general population. Now, we've said already that the T statistic that we have worked out from our consultant's data is 1.9. Um, and so I've marked that on here, and uh, this grey line is the T distribution with 8 degrees of freedom. So the question we're asking is, what is the probability of us getting a t statistic of 1.9 or greater by chance. That is to say, what's, what's the area in this part of the t distribution? And the way you would find that out is either to look in a, um, a book of statistical tables or to ask your favourite statistical programme to tell you what this probability is. Now, if you do that, you would find that the p-value is just less than 0 0.05. That is to say that in this case, we would have evidence to reject the null hypothesis and accept our research hypothesis that our consultant's predicted blood loss is greater, or our consultant's estimated blood loss is greater than that of the general population. The second hypothesis we had uh, was that our consultant's estimated blood loss is less than that in the general population. Uh, so again, I've marked on our t-statistic of 1.9, um, and this time we'd be asking, what's the chance of observing a t-statistic of 1.9 or less uh, from um, a t-distribution with 8 degrees of freedom? So that is to say, what's, what's this area? And if you work that out, you would find that it, that it was just greater than 0.95. So we've got a p-value of just greater than 0.95. So with this research hypothesis, we wouldn't have any evidence to reject the null hypothesis. And then the third hypothesis uh, was that our consultant's estimated blood loss is different from the general population. Um, 
so again, I've marked on our T statistic of 1.9. And then what we want to know in this situation is what are the chances of getting this value or this score or one that is more different under the null hypothesis. And more different could be greater than 1.9 or it could be something which is minus 1.9 or less than minus 1.9. Uh, so what we want to know here is this area. And if you to work this out, then you would find that it was just less than 0.01. So again, no evidence to reject the null hypothesis. So if you have a look at what we've done in hypothesis 1 and hypothesis 2, we've worked out the area uh, just on one side of our t-statistic value. So these are called one-sided or one-tailed tests. Whereas in our third hypothesis, where we're interested just in whether our consultant's estimated blood loss was different, then we ended up working out uh, two areas, one which was greater than our t-statistic and one which was less than negative our t-statistic, if you will. And so what we worked out there was a, a two-sided or a two-tailed test, and that's where the name comes from. So, in summary, we have had an introduction to the student's t-test. Um, there are different types of student t-test, um, and we've just covered one this time. Um, but we have come up with a way that we can do hypothesis testing, uh, where we don't know what the population standard deviation is. And then we've had a quick canter through uh, what the difference between a one and a two-sided or tailed test is.